opportunity to to, um, to, to welcome uh, our participants. Um, first, to thank our our panelists for making time to uh, to be with us um, uh, for this occasion. Uh, when uh, uh, Professor Arun Borat is presenting his findings uh, on the on the quarterly labor force survey. Uh, I just want to uh, first say that uh, we, I think we are four months and a half into uh, this project for those who have not joined our previous webinar. It's, it's a project that is supported by, by Telcom looking at, at the future economy, uh, especially against the backdrop of, of COVID-19 uh, COVID and to provide insights on, on how we can uh, map Map out uh, options for uh, for recon reconstructing and and um, and building uh, the the economy post uh, uh, COVID nineteen pa pandemic. So I just want to express uh, our grat gratitude as Vet School of Governance to uh, to Telcom for for being um, a supporter for for this project, and also to thank uh, uh, Dr. Nomfundongwenya who has been leading uh, this project from the beginning. And, and our marketing and comms team, uh, uh, Lerato and, and Kemantha, and, and various individuals uh, who have um, been very active in, in shaping the intellectual sub substance of this project. So I'm, I'm very glad that uh, we were able today to, to hear uh, insights from, from Harun Borat. I've had a pleasure, pleasure of reading uh, his paper. Uh, which looks at uh, extending the reach of the quarter labor force survey, not just to focus on the quantitative aspects, but also to look at uh, the qualitative dimensions of, uh, of, of, the, sub of the survey, especially uh, the, the quality of um, the individual's job in, in the labor market, uh, the range of, of uh, areas that we, we, we look at, uh, such as medical aid, um, contract of service, and, and so on. And, and these have been discussed in the public domain um, as part of uh, looking at, at, at our uh, you know, labor regulatory framework. Uh, but Harun comes with a very fresh perspective to look at the qualitative aspects, what, what, what uh, is the precise quality of the individual's job in, in the labor market, and how can that help us to think about uh, the, the structure of, of work or the future of, of work in the South African economy. So with those words, I would like to, uh, to welcome everyone to, uh, to, to this discussion and, uh, and, and hand over back to uh, the, uh, the chair of the panel, Alex. Thank you, Prof, for the introduction. And I would like to thank uh, Professor Harun and the discussants, uh, Dr. Niva Macheta and uh, Ms. Male Radomsiana for making themselves available and the Vet School of Governance South Africa's Future Economy Project for organizing this session. As South Africa grapples with the devastating impact of COVID-19 on employment and its implications for labor market policies. It is increasingly important to improve the accuracy of employment data. While the country produces high quality, regular labor force survey data, there remains room for improvement. Drawing on recommendations emerging from the Vet School of Governance South African Future Economy Project, this webinar assesses the current instrument for the South African labor force survey data, the quarterly labor force survey. This session identifies challenges to the quarterly labor force survey and looks at recommendations tabled on how to improve the examination of trends in earnings and employment to enhance analysis of the labor market issues. Our speaker today is Professor Harun Borat, uh, who is a professor of economics and director of the development research unit at the University of Cape Town. His research interests cover labor economics poverty, and income distribution. He is currently a member of the Presidential Economic Advisory Council, having also served as an advisor to the South African Parliament's high-level panel on acceleration of change and transformation. Professor Borat holds a highly prestigious national research chair on the theme economic growth, poverty, and inequality. 
exploring the interactions for South Africa. He's a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and Institute of Labor Economic Research Fellow. He sits on the editorial advisory board of the World Bank Economic Review and is a board member of the National Research Foundation, as well as the United Nations University World Institute for Development, Economics and Research. Professor Borat is a member of the UNDP 2020 Human Development Report Advisory Board, the United Nations World Health Organization High Level Commission on Health and Employment and Economic Growth, the World Bank's Commission on Global Poverty, and he was head of the research for the United Nations High Level Panel on the post-2015 development agenda. Professor Borat was an economic advisor to the two past ministers of finance and previous South African presidents, formerly serving on the presidential economic advisory panel. He has a PhD from Stellenbosch University, studied at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and was a Cornell University Research Fellow. He will be addressing the webinar for 15 minutes. Professor Borat, the platform is yours and welcome. Thank you very, very much, uh, Alex. And um, I will rely on you to keep me to time as well as uh, please alert me if there are any um, uh, bandwidth uh, concerns. So, so in many ways, um, the and just checking through you, uh, Chair, that you can see my screen. Yes, the screen okay. is visible. Excellent. So in many ways, this is a fairly tightly conceived, um, dare I say, sort of narrow um, uh, paper in that um, and, and the brief came from um, Mzu and his team to, to how can we, and it, it actually a very good opportunity to be honest, right? To put our thoughts down. Many of us uh, probably on this webinar have, have uh, individual ideas about the labor force survey data, what the concerns may be, certainly what we could add um, into, into um, uh, the, the, what is probably the bedrock for our labor force statistics and certainly our labor market statistics for South Africa. So in that, in that sense, the paper essentially, uh, the guts of the paper really around looking at some of the challenges that we face with respect to uh, ongoing challenges with respect to the quarterly labor force surveys. And then um, there's a discussion where I pick up um, with colleagues, I should have noted um, my co-authors, Robert Hill and Francois Steenkamp. Um, we then look at possible extensions to the QLFS. So in other words, you know, if, if we are able to, if we um, uh, not necessarily had the magic wand, to be honest, if we were able to have productive discussions with Stats SA, what are the kinds of extensions we could include um, into the, um, the quarterly labor force survey? But let me just sort of step back a little bit, right? And because um, we often, as South Africans, I was saying this morning in another webinar, we tend to sort of always look, we're very parochial, which can be good, but sometimes we're overly critical, right? I mean, so if we step back and just to look at this table of the sort of sample in this table from the ILO of 168 countries in their sample, 61% of countries, and that's globally, right? Um, do not have a regularly implemented labor force survey, right? Um, either, either most recently or implemented on a quarterly basis. So, so essentially we, we sit in a good uh, sample of minority, a minority of countries, that's the sort of make it 60, 40, about 40% 40 of countries who actually do uh, have regular and updated quarterly labor force surveys. So it's an incredibly rare, um, um, uh, country, if you like, that is both developing and within the continent that runs regular updated quarterly labor force surveys. So, you know, everything that flows in terms of the critique and in terms of possible extension should keep that in mind that um, we are, we, we have set an incredibly high bar and Stats SA and um, st the statistical authorities generally should be commended for that. Um, and I think it comes back to a period uh, dating back to 1994 when we had the first October household survey and then this continuous sort of updating and upgrading of our labor force statistics. So the, the, the fact that we in uh, that, that small sample of 22 developing countries that actually do have um, 
regular labor force surveys and then only one of two African countries that can fall in that does fall into that sample is something to be commended. So within that context of sort of very laudable um, production of regular labor market statistics, what are the kinds of things uh, that we'd like to look at? Well, firstly, just pick up on some of the specific challenges with respect to the QLSF. Um, look at potential interventions <clears throat> where we could look at improving the survey and, and that'll come out in the challenges that we raise. And then finally, as I said, we'll look at the um, extensions. So let's just be clear, um, uh, and it's probably well known to most on this webinar, that you know, your, your quarterly labor force surveys are distinct from um, income and expenditure surveys, the general household survey and so on, in that it is, it is the instrument um, necessary to measure labor market data or labor market indicators. Um, so it's not the instrument that we can and should be using, say, to examine household poverty or household inequality. That, that sits elsewhere. Uh, but it does mean that you've got to get very accurate labor market data, right? And it's the only place we can get accurate individual characteristics-based labor market data. And as an extension, if we're thinking about the evolution of earnings, if we're thinking about the evolution of employment, of unemployment, of um, earnings inequality as second order questions or um, types of employment that's being created, whether it's formal or informal, all of this stuff sits within um, the quarterly labor force survey. I'll make one addition, which I'll pick up on later, and it's noted in the paper, um, is that often what falls between the cracks are, if you like, the determinants of labor market outcomes. And often those can be things like schooling. And that's the most obvious one, which I pick up on later. And there isn't a regular individual characteristics type survey that's detailed enough on something as important as schooling or, or human capital generally. And I would argue that that's a key part of improvements that can be brought to bear in the QLFS, and, and I'll come back to that. So what is the first challenge? Uh, there's a little bit of a mouthful here on the on the slide, but, but in essence, the challenge, uh, as, as um, um, detailed as it sounds, is incredibly important. It relates to what we call the imputation of earnings. And, and in essence, um, and uh, having thought that I have lots of time, I see I'm halfway through already. So in essence, you have an imputation method for earnings data. So earnings data can be reported in brackets, actual point estimates or their refusal. So in other words, somebody will say they earn 1,200 Rand or they'll say they earn between 1,000 or 5,000 uh, rands, and they, they choose a bracket. And some may refuse or say they don't know. The problem has been is that Stats SA has um, earnings data from uh, up until the second quarter of 2012 which imputed earnings for both bracket responses and refusals, right? And you can't determine in the final data that's produced, which were value responses like point estimates, which were bracket responses, which were refusals, right? That's one thing, but then what happens is in the third, from the third quarter of 2012 onwards, um, there's no imputation any longer for refusals, right? And so in many ways you end up with two different series on the QLFS side of earnings data by which the imputation method has changed, right? When you add in the October household survey from 95 onwards to 2000, you end up with three effectively types of earnings data or, or more accurately earnings data that has been derived and uh, presented to the final user in a different way, right? And so when you start having changes in imputation effects, right? in which you can't open the black box of the imputation methods, you have unreliable um, 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 earnings data. And, uh, and, and I should have said that this is work, um, incidentally, that we borrow um, very heavily from by Andrew Kerr and Martin Wittenberg. And that's an excellent work on, um, on the household survey and labor force survey data. And the example they use when comparing the stats SA imputation method which is over here, right? Versus what, what is called the unimputed uh, wage data, but is actually their imputation method, right? Rather than, so it's rather 
instead it's a it's a non stats sa imputation method and you'll see here just very simply public sector wage premiums on an earnings function by year just cast your eye and you see sort of um, if I imaginary line in the middle of this table, that you get much lower public sector wage premia for the stats SA imputation method versus um, the Wittenberg Kerr method. And in essence, all that suggests, right, um, rather than saying you wrong, we right, is that the imputation of earnings. So in other words, when you think about how you measure earnings, if it's not clear which imputation method is being used, when and 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 if you change your imputation method, it's going to get you, uh, uh, it's going to give you materially different information about actual earnings, if you like, in the labor market. And therefore, and that's the second order question, it's going to give you very different, it could potentially, and that's the point here, give you very different um, answers about um, determinants of earnings. Do public sector workers earn more than private sector workers, if so, by how much? And depending on the underlying data, if it's uh, worrying, then you get different answers. The second concern was around um, measuring employment with respect to the informal sector. And what happens is uh, stats to say changes the definition of the informal sector in the third quarter of 2009. Um, the, the specific concern uh, that arises is that the question on informality um, allows for, um, let's put it in, um, uncertainty around who is defined as being informal. Um, essentially, if you are a low wage, non-tax paying worker in a formal small enterprise like a medical practice, you could potentially be categorized as being informal. And so the ambiguity of the definition of informality leads to the uncertainty in what we're measuring. The third challenge with respect to um, uh, the QLFS, uh, and, and this one we've seen a couple of times over the years, and um, here we just pick up on one, which is as good as Stats SA is in communicating about releases and so on, often it's really difficult for researchers and data analysts to figure out the more detailed let's call it statistically relevant changes that have been made. And, and one very good example was the change in the sampling um, and the, in particular, the master sample for, uh, uh, um, for the QLFS over a specific period. So you had this growth and, and the trigger often is a result that you see that's very odd in the data. So the trigger was this employment growth in a period in Western Cape's agriculture, agriculture sector, 2015 quarter one, when we had the most severe drought in that province. But it was later discovered that actually it was the master sample that was changed over that period that affected the selection of surveyed households into uh, the final um, sample, and that then affected um, um, employment numbers. So it's those kinds of detailed uh, uh, sort of sampling changes, weight changes, and so on, which often sit, as I say, in the detailed metadata and sometimes are not reported by stats SA, that can be really, really um, uh, material in terms of impacting on labor market outcomes. There's a fourth challenge, but that's, that's generic and I would argue germane to almost all statistical authorities around the world is as you use and you need to use technology um, uh, to do your surveys, we're starting to move from face-to-face -to, -face to these catty uh, interviews and I know Neva as the discussion coming through we've had a, we've had some engagement around this there's, there's there are problems with the catty method right the obvious is that it's a biased sample in terms of individuals who have a cell phone if you don't have a cell phone or you live in a rural area you may have a cell phone but the signal is weak and um, uh, um, surveyors can't reach those individuals you're going to get non-response rates that are biased now any non-response rates that are not random any any survey statistician will tell you is like a huge red flag. Now, if you've set up your sampling design and instrument so that you have a technology-based system that's going to have non-random uh, non-response rate, you need to be very, very careful about that. Um, Stats SA is clearly thinking about this. As uh, all of you may have known, there was a delay in the release of the second quarter of uh, this year's QLFS. And I think a lot of that had to do with 
the fact that they've just kick-started the CATI method and they're beginning to figure out how to, how to uh, cope with this new system and this new technology. So what are some of the possible extensions? Um, you know, I, I, I want to start out quickly by saying that we almost at a stage where, and, and Neva is fond of saying it, and I agree with Neva, is that don't tell me, you know, that the unemployment rate is 25.1 or 25.3. We just know it's really, really high. <laughs> uh, and, and in many ways, that reflects the fact that as policymakers, as researchers, as academics, we have a strong grasp of the of the broad contours of the South African labor market. So, you know, the, the fundamental core indicators we know and we know really well, expanded narrow definition of unemployment, uh, even I would argue employment by sector and so on. And so a lot of the extensions I think about what could be done with the QLFS is to get us to, to second order um, type questions. For example, we know very little about the quality of jobs, right? Um, Zoo mentioned this at the outset. We know very little about um, how individuals uh, rate their uh, satisfaction on their job. We know very little about voice. Uh, ILO talks about voice in the bargaining sense amongst workers. We know very little about that. We know very little about career aspirations, um, training on the job, all those second order questions that are critical for understanding the labor market we, 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 we have very little information on. We also, um, and I've written extensively about this, have very little information about what are called labor brokers or temporary employment service providers. We are forced through the way in which the QLFS is set up to go into the not elsewhere classified um, uh, category of business activities within financial and business service. So it's a real sort of roundabout way to extract um, a, a, an estimate for those workers being employed by temporary employment service providers. We get an estimate about 6% of total employment. That's a massive number, but I think it's an imperfect capturing of a key um, part of the labor market that's grown dramatically uh, over the last decade or so. And, and it's an easy fix. I think there's a way in which the question can be altered within the survey to ask employers, uh, to ask interviews directly do you work for a specific um, labor broker or temporary employment service provider? And I think that should be done. There's also a problem in combining, and in, to some extent, this is a bit about, about, about our second order questions. If you're thinking about broad labor market indicators, well, one of the things that's really important is what's going on in the household. One of the key, as we know, instruments of poverty alleviation in the household is looking at grants. Yet the way in which the QLFS is set up um, is, Unfortunately, the question is asked only in that part of the survey that focuses on the unemployed. So in a simple way, you actually don't understand for the household as a whole, or let's say for labor market um, participants as a whole, what kind of grants are entering into the household they live in. What that does is it opens up all sorts of questions around um, does, the, does the presence of a grant influence the probability of being employed, of searching for a job, uh, of participating in the labor market and so on? And, and at the moment, we, don't, we can't um, capture that kind of information. Again, I think it's fairly easy to actually set up a survey and a question within the survey to do that. One of the things, again, I recall sitting in a meeting with... Um, uh, Angus Deaton, since won the Nobel Prize in National Treasury, in Church Square, in um, uh, with Stats SA there, and this was 10, 10 years ago, and we asked the question, can we not have the actual names of the institutions of either secondary or tertiary institutions and their location that individuals have attended or currently enrolled in? What that does crucially is it's, it opens up the door, and this is my point earlier about schooling in the labor market, it opens up the door to detailed analysis about type of human capital institution and labor market outcomes. It opens up the door if you look at what did you study at the higher education institution and the degree program and so on, opens up all sorts of um, linkages between quality of human capital accumulation and labor market outcomes. I think that's a critical thing um, to take care of. Um, the, other, the other thing I've added in here is that we do need to be thinking about um, what I call sort of policy relevant data. 
At the moment, we don't ask uh, an individual, do they know if they're on a wage subsidy? We don't ask sufficient detailed data about public works or community works programs. Finally, um, and, and this is sort of coming again from people like uh, Debbie Budlinder and others, you could look at um, a rotating sense in which some of the QLFSs will have a special module focused on a specific theme. There was a, there, there was a time when we had a very detailed module on migration, for example. It seems to me as big as the issue is, we need to be thinking creatively of using the QLFS to understand um, the growth of cross-border migration and the extent to which we have, say, workers from the region in, in the South African labor market. We need to, we clearly need a proper statistical attempt at capturing those numbers because the issue keeps on coming up in all sorts of fora. The one example I've used, but it's sort of biased on our own work, in terms of our own work, is there's a, there's an, um, a rich new literature on the impact of the fourth industrial revolution on tasks and how uh, occupations and tasks are now becoming synonymous. And, and again, the techniques there to include that kind of data um, in, in, in the survey. So that's really my, my, my overview. I mean, in many ways, um, I, I wanna come back to my first statement that this is a, a country, we are a country with very high quality regular labor force survey data compared to other developing countries. Um, We've, we though can improve, particularly on the earnings side, I think employment on the informal sector, but the earnings data, really we need more clarity so that we can work with trying to get much better consistent data. I think if you had to pick two issues around um, extending the QLFS or getting better data or new data, I would, I would talk about TES, temporary employment services are critical. And then the schooling matter in terms of institutions of higher education uh, is critical. Um, but ultimately, I think as a, as a final concluding point, I think government should also begin to see the QLFS as a part instrument for measuring the impact of its own policies, be that social grants, uh, as well as uh, uh, more broadly active labor market policies. Thanks very much. Thank you, uh, Prof, for a wonderful presentation and insightful uh, uh, work. Uh, let me take this opportunity to remind uh, the attendees that we have uh, the Q&A uh, uh, on the dashboard. In the meantime, if you have any question you would like to ask, uh, please uh, make use of the Q&A uh, on the dashboard to type your question. We will be having uh, two of our discussions, two of our discussions. Uh, uh, making their remarks. The first is Dr. Niva Machetla, who has been a senior economist, trade and industrial policy at the Trade and Industrial Policy Strategy since November 2015. She was Deputy Director General for the Economic Policy in the Economic uh, Development Department from 2010 to 2015. Before joining the department, Dr. Marketa worked for the presidency, the Development Bank of Southern Africa, and the Congress of South African Trade Unions, as well as other government departments. Prior to 1994, she worked in various universities in Africa and the United States. She is currently a member of the National Minimum Wage Commission. Dr. Marketa's research and publication centers on industrial policy and value chain analysis and on socioeconomic challenges facing South Africa, especially employment creation and inequality. We also have uh, Ms. Lerato Musiani uh, from Statistics South Africa, who works for Stats SA as an acting chief director for Labor Statistics Division. She is responsible for the production of labor statistics through the quarterly labor force survey, a survey on volunteer work, a survey on time use, a survey on child labor, and informal sector survey and school to work transition survey. She holds a master's degree in biostatics and epidemiology from the University of the Widowers Rand and a master's degree in applied labor economics for development through the International Labor Organization Training Center and the University of uh, Turin. We will invite Dr. Machetla uh, to reflect in 10 minutes 
and she will be followed by uh, Ms. Merato Musiani. Over to you, Dr. Mahetla. Welcome. Thank you, Alex. So yeah, I just want to join Haroon in saying thank you to everybody for this discussion, um, and also to Stats SA for publishing such high quality household survey data, both the QLFS and the General Household Survey. And I totally want to agree with Haroon that um, in that context, greater transparency around changes in questions would be good. You know, it's often important to have stability in this series, but, and so, you know, fine tuning, and I think this is something we need to think about as we look at what should be in the surveys that adding questions and changing questions means you don't have the historic view, even if the question itself has improved over time. So getting that balance right is important. Um, but I do think that when we change things, we need to be very clear about what has been changed because it makes it easier for people to interpret the findings. Um, and I'm glad who also raised the issue around the last two surveys. Um, it was unavoidable, and I'm really happy that Stats SA has been transparent about it. Um, but I also think it's worth flagging in terms of the project as a whole that as we look at the recovery, it's important to say until the pandemic is under control, there will be limits on what can be done. And so we can't just look into the very long term and what would be the big broad strategies, but also um, how do we manage the restrictions on the economy until the pandemic is under control, which looks like another year, so that we can minimize the damage without just letting the pandemic, you know, just, without just saying open up everything and end up with a huge pandemic like they have in Europe and the United, United States. Um, and I think so that phasing issue becomes important in terms of how we think about these things. In terms of the QLFS, you know, I think we really need to be careful that my main concerns about the QLFS are, as we've said, it's a high quality survey. We want to maintain that quality. My one big concern there is that the labor market dynamics, which is where you can get the consolidated income data for the year, has tended to be quite delayed. Um, and, you know, income data is very critical for South Africa. So I worry that it's often, you know, quite unpredictable when it will come out. Um, and that yet it's a very important piece, you know, very important survey for economic analysis. In that context, I would be concerned that, you know, we should be cautious about saying add more questions if that would, you know, lead to further delays or, or overburden the system. Um, you know, Haroon suggested maybe you could make it biannual instead of quarterly. My understanding, and I mean, Malarato can speak to all of these things, but my understanding I was told by somebody once is that they made it quarterly because it means that it's easier to employ enumerators over the long run so that, that you don't have to continuously retrain people. That's obviously important for quality and it's an important consideration. Um, I do think that for any exercise like this, there's always the tension between capturing the standard global indicators so that we can do comparisons with other countries and benchmark ourselves and capturing the information we need on South African problems that are quite unique. So for South Africa, I would argue the main labor market issues are that we have very low levels of employment, um, which is linked in large part to low levels of self-employment, especially in agriculture, because of course, small-scale agriculture here was destroyed in a way that did not happen in most other upper middle income economies. So, you know, if you look at the average for upper middle income countries, around 20% of employed people are self-employed, almost all in agriculture. Here, the figures like 5% and very few in agriculture. So that's one area where we might need more information than the norm. And then the other place where in labor issues where we are unique is these unusually deep inequalities within employment. You know, Haroon mentioned some like the whole casualization story. And those inequalities are linked in part to preconditions like Haroon also mentioned education, but also you know, assets and business ownership and location. So people who were in the historic labor sending regions, you know, are far less likely to be employed than people who are living in Gauteng. But there's also persistent workplace inequalities um, and that's linked to inequality in pay. So work organization is unusually unequal and so is remuneration. It's partially due to which sectors are unionized, but even more it's due to the way um, the majority of the, of the labor force has been de-skilled over time, I mean, of jobs, not the labor force, but also the labor force, has been de-skilled over time in order to increase, I would argue, the premium to skilled people. And, you know, Haroon's kind of mentioned this, but I think it's important to say, 
To me, the question would be, could we get more information on these issues that would give us better insights for policy? In this context, a real strength of the QLFS has been not only that they capture race and gender, but they also capture geography and union membership. And I think that's been really helpful in understanding trends in overcoming the apartheid legacy and developing a more equitable work workplace and um, employment systems. But there are some areas where I'd like more information, but again, the quality and the timing, you know, getting the quality and timing right on existing questions seems to me to be more important than adding some. And I do think the one thing that, that was started at one point and seems not to have been continued is to say some of these, this information we may not need on a quarterly basis. We could do a little bit of an in-depth follow-up where relevant like what was done with the informal sector for a couple of years. So I totally agree with Haroon. More information on migration would be an important indicator. Um, for instance, questions that ask if people move to the region where they're working after they were 18, and also if they moved in order to take up their current employment. I mean, when you look at mining, it's really clear. You know, you have miners who came from the historic labor sending regions, they went to Gauteng to work on the gold mines, and then they moved further on to move in the platinum mines as the gold mines closed down. You know, and, and we didn't really have an instrument that would let us capture that in real time, I think, um, although it's become really clear in retrospect. A second thing, again, is small business and self-employment, which again is one of the areas where South Africa diverges from its peers. Like I said, for a while there, there was a follow-up survey that happened every couple of years um, on the informal sector. You know, it, it, it would be nice to see if that could be expanded. Um, as Haroon and, and his colleagues know, workplace organization is, you know, how the workplace is organized, how the labor process is organized is also an important issue for us because the apartheid workplace had very specific characteristics that are quite different from most in the world. I'm not sure, you know, the one thing I would say is I'm not sure this is something we need a big survey for or a quarterly survey for. And I also think it's important to be sure that the questions relate to the realities of South African history rather than the global north. But I do think, you know, every few years a survey so you could see that what trends would be good. So for instance, I worked on a big survey for COSATU for a couple of years. And, you know, we asked people, did they think there was racial or gender abuse in their workplace? But also generally, did they feel abused in the workplace? Um, you know, and the results were quite interesting. Um, do the people feel they have a chance of promotion? Do they get training on the job? Do they have a system where they have clearly defined pay skills? You know, those are the kinds of questions that give you an insight into how much has the workplace transformed towards a more sort of modern, more flexible, um, and more supportive workplace as opposed to the kind of top-down, de-skilled workplace that was established historically. And I agree totally with Haroon. We need more about competencies in schooling. I do think more in post-school training would be good. So it's quite hard to tell from the existing data, whether people have had post-school training that's at all substantive, particularly I think issue we need to look at is apprenticeships because that's always been a key issue that, that we would like more information on, but even shorter term training and learnerships, you know, it'd be very nice to be able to say how many days of formal training do people get in the workplace and how does it correlate, for instance, with occupation and, in, and industry, given we've put so much effort into the skill system. Um, also, in terms of competencies in school, one of the big questions I don't think we have a good answer on, and again, many of these things you might say we don't need to put into a quarterly labor force survey. We might just say, can we do an in-depth survey every few years? But, you know, does it make a difference what your first language was um, or, and your second language? Does it make a difference whether you had access to computers in school, to math, to science? Did you have a library? You know, in the education discourse, we tend to assume these are indicators of quality and of competencies we need in the workplace, but we've never been able to actually say how do they correlate with employment and incomes on a large scale. The current questions, as Haroon notes, are quite vague. So, and Haroon, then I had one more question just that I'm not clear on. Um, you know this, employed people don't actually get grants. Um, even the COVID-19 grant only goes to people who have no other income. People in their households might. I think the really interesting question here that's always been frustrating is it's very hard to break down household income by source. Um, and it's very hard to link it to the LFS data. I do think um, 
if we could strengthen the earnings and employment questions in the general household survey, that might be more useful. Um, because, you know, you can ask, I suppose you could ask people in that, if anyone in their household gets a grant or try and correlate it with the other household members in the survey. But I suspect, you know, you might end up with a fairly small survey because of the means testing on the, on the grants. Anyways, I think it's a really interesting process and a really interesting paper. And thank you for letting me participate. Ta. Chair, you are muted. Uh, Alex, you're on mute. Thank you. I unmute, but it mutes me again. I hope that um, you can hear me now. Thank you, Dr. Machetla, for, for, for your comments. <laughs> Uh, let's now take this opportunity to welcome uh, Ms. Malratum Siani. And before that, uh, remind attendees that we have the Q&A icon where you can ask uh, a question. Uh, Dr. Barat, I shared with you a question on the chat and I will be directing the questions on the chat uh, to, uh, to yourself as the speaker and to our discussions in the interest of time, you can look at the question and I will be inviting you to answer the question. Uh, uh, Malrato, please take the stage is yours. This is the digital stage we are talking about. Uh, thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Chair, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm going to be discussing the paper that has been presented in front of us. And most of the challenges that have been highlighted here, I will be uh, taking you through some of the answers or how we can move forward in this regard. Uh, in terms of uh, the challenge that has been raised regarding uh, imputations on earnings, we are aware that there are some shortcomings in terms of our data. And Professor Kerr from, the, from UCT has raised some concerns uh, pertaining to the imputations that we are uh, applying to the uh, QLFS data. And uh, we are currently engaging with him to see how we can probably review our imputation methods. And there was a time when he recently uh, submitted a request as, as I say, to say, maybe it will be ideal if the data is uh, published and edited, but we are still engaging on those issues. And also the National Minimum Wage uh, Commission also requested the earnings that are unedited. So this uh, tells us that our users really want the uh, data that is unedited so they can see exactly how much uh, people are earning. So we will be engaging on these issues uh, going forward. Uh, on the issue of the definition of the informal sector that was changed, as far as I know, I, I'm not aware of uh, the change that has been introduced uh, to the definition, but of course we can engage uh, on this issue because we, want, we don't want any ambiguities as the, the data is being used by uh, our stakeholders. Uh, regarding the communication, when there are changes to the Cotton Labor Force Survey, we always try our best to communicate prior to the data being uh, disseminated, if there have been any major changes that have been uh, applied to the QLFS, especially relating to the methodology or the content of the uh, QLFS uh, questionnaire and any other changes that uh, may occur along uh, any part or phase of the statistical value chain. So we do communicate regularly. And if there are instances where there was no communication, of course, we'll be uh, looking at this and because we want to improve uh, communication uh, going forward for all the products that we produce within StatSA. And uh, lastly, the challenge that was raised was uh, in relation to a change in the mode of collection during the lockdown as a result of COVID-19. And Stata say was aware, even before we started with um, a CATI collection 
that uh, it will not be possible for us to reach out to the full sample. And it was likely that those who have telephone numbers might be in employment more than those who don't have uh, contact numbers. And we are aware that this introduced bias in the estimates that we have for the QLFS quarter two. And as such, we have uh, done some adjustments uh, in that regard. And the adjustment methodology that was followed is uh, contained in the report that we published uh, in September based on the QLFS of the second quarter of 2020. Now turning to the potential extension of the QLFS, there are several areas that have been uh, raised in terms of how uh, the QLF QLFS can be expanded. And uh, the paper further recommends that the frequency should be reviewed. Maybe perhaps we can go back to collecting the QLFS or labor force survey uh, twice yearly like we used to do before. Or if we keep the quarterly collection, then we should have the rotating uh, modules that focus on key labor market indicators. So let's just say, wants to remain relevant and collect information that is being used by its uh, users. So there's no point in us collecting information if no one is going to be using it. So we need to engage all the uh, QLFS uh, stakeholders, including the researchers, to ensure that what we produce is what they, they want. And uh, the information that we produce is relevant for the policy uh, or the current policy issues in the country. So it is important that uh, we engage as soon as possible to see which of the proposed uh, areas can be included in the QLFS questionnaire because as you may be aware, there are a lot of budget cuts to status say, but we try our best to keep producing the key labor market uh, information on a quarterly basis. So we will need to look at the areas and prioritize the ones that we think are urgently needed for your purposes and other users as well. And in terms of um, the question on grants being extended to those who are employed, initially when this question was included in the questionnaire, the aim was really to establish uh, for those who are not having jobs, how do they support themselves? Are they receiving any social grants or what are the other means of uh, survival that they may be having? And uh, we, uh, there was also um, a proposal to uh, expand to include public works programs. And we are already including a module every first quarter of the year on the expanded public works program. And uh, we were provided with questions by the Department of Public Works and their aim was really to measure the impact of the project. And we may have to engage again in collaboration with them to see how we can um, uh, improve on the module that they had uh, previously provided for us to collect information uh, on. And also uh, on the proposal of having a modular approach to the QLFS in terms of additional uh, questions, we already have modules that are attached to the QLFS. Uh, every third quarter of the year, we have a different module. Uh, it's only this year where we did not have a module. Uh, we were supposed to have uh, a module or rather a survey of time use but because of budgetary constraints, we could not have uh, this uh, survey. So we have modules on child labor, the informal sector businesses, a module that focuses on informal sector businesses, as well as a module on volunteer work. And also once in four, in four years, we include a module on migration to the QLFS questionnaire. And this module is also uh, included in the current uh, general household survey questionnaire. So it is possible to actually add modules, but we also need to, to make sure that whatever module we include, it's not so large that it significantly increases the cost of collecting uh, the QLFS, including that uh, particular module. Uh, so in conclusion, 
I think given the fact that there are so many challenges that have been raised regarding the QLFS, perhaps it would be ideal to first deal with the challenges uh, first, even before we can consider making any extensions to, to the same product that we have challenges with. So perhaps uh, Status A will have to facilitate a session where we engage as early as um, early 2021, where we can get uh, all the key stakeholders uh, to sit around the table and discuss or rather review the current instrument that we are using for the QLFS to see if it still meets their, their needs or whether there's a need for us to include uh, different questions. Maybe some of the questions that we currently have are no longer relevant. There are more pressing uh, uh, policy area questions that we may need to, to include uh, in the instrument. I thank you. Thank you, Memusian, um, for your response. Uh, this is now the time for questions. We received uh, one question, which uh, I shared with uh, Professor Borat. It is a question from Maria, uh, who is a new labor market specialist for the Decent Work Team at ILO in the beautiful city of Tswane. Uh, the question reads as follows, taking note of the challenges you mentioned, Prof, with regards to imputation of earnings data, do you know if there has been an exercise to compare administrative data for earnings to the quarterly labor force survey data for earnings? If yes, what was the result? Keeping in mind that the administrative data may uh, consist of only formal sector data. Uh, she's from the Seychelles, and it is good for her to note and acknowledge that Seychelles also conducts a quarterly labor force survey alongside Mauritius and South Africa. So there are three countries uh, in the region that do so. Just before, Prof, you take this question, let me commend you for and your colleagues for taking the direction you have taken in your study. Those of us who study the labor process and labor process changes and their implications for work must be excited with the direction that your study has triggered. Particularly your mention of new technologies and the changing nature of work. And if I may conclude on this comment, uh, your proposal on the extensions are very important for that category of researchers in that they begin to move us to thinking about ways in which we can account and measure decent work when we look at the quarterly labor force survey, uh, particularly with the direction uh, summarized by Professor Go at the beginning uh, of now beginning to look at quality, you know, uh, uh, the quality of jobs, uh, employment relationship, Earning, and of course, there are other things that you have mentioned. Thank you for that. Uh, the stage is now yours uh, to respond to the question asked by Lerato, and you can also make comments on the inputs by Dr. Macheta and Memusia. Okay. Thank, thanks very much, Alex, um, uh, and um, thanks both for for. Um, uh, Neva's input and uh, Malerato's input, which I thought were excellent, um, and, and the question. So, so in terms of maybe just very quickly, the question from Maria from the ILO. So as far as I'm aware, there hasn't been an exhaustive and careful comparison of administrative data to the labor force survey data. And a lot of that is a function of um, access to the administrative data. And if you mean, if by administrative data, you mean a combination of sort of private sector uh, information that's often collected by placement agencies and so on, and public sector data would probably be that which sits in what we call the Purcell data. Both of those are actually not easily available to researchers. So in fact, um, the QLFS earnings data is the only publicly available data that we, uh, that we can use. So so they actually, because of access issues, there hasn't been a comparative exercise. I think it would be interesting to do. Um, 
the immediate question would be comparability across surveys with respect to representativity. So the private sector data is not necessarily representative. Um, and so that would be my first concern. You do have the quarterly employment survey data, incidentally, which is firm-based data, but they don't correct, collect individual level data. They collect sort of average wages or wage bill data from firms. So that, that's another sort of perhaps at the mean level, at the average level, where you can look at um, comparisons. Um, then just very quickly, um, Chair, a few, a few comments I wanted to pick up on, uh, and maybe the grants one is really important because both um, uh, Neva and Malarato mentioned this, and I want to clarify why we want the grants question changed, is because you know, the mental model in a status is correct. You do want to understand what are the other sources of income that the unemployed have access to. That makes sense, yes. But in addition, there's of course this vast literature about what impact does the grants have on all sorts of labor market behavior, whether to participate in the labor market or not, whether to, uh, does it enable you to search harder relative to others uh, more actively, if you like. Um, maybe it even influences whether you take a job at all, right? Um, because you have a certain income and uh, through the grants. And so all we're really asking for is a change in the question so that it's asked um, in a way that we understand all income sources like grants coming into the household as a whole. And if you can then say, look, if, if you have lots of grants going into a household, the probability of participation actually declines or does or does not change, for example. You can't answer those um, extended questions without um, with the current format that you have. So I think that's a really important, and I don't think it would be expensive. It's not additional questions. It's just the orientation uh, and the pivoting of the questions. Um, uh, I, I like the comment from Valerato about sort of the trade-off between frequency. So do they reduce the frequency and then add in longer questions? I think that would be a really uh, useful discussion to have. You know, in terms of communication, there is regular communication from StatsSA, really, really good, actually. Um, the challenge is, I think sometimes there's very specialist communication that's required. So when you change the sampling design, when you look at the master sample, when the weights are changed, I think it's worth having two forms of communication, the general to the public, and then very specialist communication, maybe even run through the Stats Council, um, which we spoke about. So I sat on the Stats Council, Stats Council about a decade ago, and we spoke about sort of tailoring your communication to specialist users versus general users. Um, yeah, I, I would still make a, 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 I would still ask respectfully that um, stats to say consider the paper with an eye to what are the no budget, so budget neutral changes that can be made. And obviously have a, have a discussion with other users, specialist users. But for me, uh, one no brainer is the temporary employment service providers. I mean, if you've got a million jobs coming from that particular type of employment, it seems really useful to think about a budget neutral way to ask that question. And so perhaps just in conclusion, Chair, I mean, one of the things that may be useful as an output maybe for, for, for um, the Witt School of Governance to think about is, can we come up with budget neutral changes to the survey, which we think would add to our knowledge and understanding of the South African labor market? Thank you, Prof. Uh, it is now one minute after one, or the 18th hour of the day. Uh, this was our set time to conclude the, 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 the seminar. Thank you, Professor Borat, uh, for your presentation. Dr. Niva Machetla, thank you for making yourself available and for the comments made. Uh, Ms. Malerato, um, Siani, thank you, Mama, for making yourself available. Uh, Lerato, uh, events coordinator at the Vet School of Governance uh, in the project, thank you for the work you have done in coordinating the program.
and Dr. Nomfundo Mwenya, my colleague uh, in uh, another institute. Thank you for supporting the project. And uh, Professor Kobo, thank you uh, for organizing uh, this seminar series. We are learning a lot and uh, <clears throat> many of us will be following developments from the education content that we are learning from this session. Let me also take this opportunity equally to thank all our attendees for making their time to attend this important session. This is about development. It is about improvement in our research work, data collection, analysis, and it will go quite a long way in moving forward. We are sorry, Memusiane, uh, about the budget cuts. Uh, we are in a very difficult economic situation, in a crisis, actually. We need a way out of this, but at the same time, we need to prioritize uh, important baseline programs like those undertaken by Statistics South Africa. Thank you very much. Allow me all to end our session at this stage so that when we invite you in future, you will know that we are a timekeeping institution. Thank you very much.